Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to see so many people and having a seminar with uh, the welfare for wild animals. Um, I started working with wild animals 30 years ago and as a wildlife vet, I've been doing, involved in wildlife research and uh, conservation projects for 20 years. Um, there's a lot of similarities and challenges when you work with wildlife, with, independent of species or where you are in the world, and we can extrapolate and learn from different species. My PhD thesis was focused on uh, wildlife capture, but today that would count, I could, it could count as a welfare uh, subject as well, because a lot of these studies involve the welfare for the animals. Today I'm working a lot with uh, Asian wildlife and in the One Health perspective. I'd like to ask here, how many people in here has been part of a wildlife anesthesia or capture? So maybe a third of a fourth of the people. So in the next 15 minutes, I'd like to bring you to a number of different captures and we'll see what can happen and how we can prevent some of the complications. So why animals are being captured, we've seen there's coloring, disease monitoring, translocation, many different reasons. And how they are captured depends not only on the species and the habitat they live in, but it could also be resources, limited resources. Or, but for many species, there is no well-established capture method, and there is no drug combination that is recommended. So there's a lot, still a lot of work and lead, not a, lot of, a need for a lot of research within this subject. Um, if we look at... Sorry. What is the safe wildlife capture? So you often see like, oh, we, had it, we have a great capture method, no animals dying, or it's a very low capture mortality. But there's a lot between surviving a capture and how you are doing. Preferably, I'd like the animal to be in as good health before it was captured as after. So there's morbidity. Morbidity is the health of the animal, how it's being influenced versus mortality. And there's a lot of questions we can ask before, during and after handling a wild animal, which will, like, how does it affect the wild animal health? Can the stress be prevented? Why should hypoxemia be prevented? All these things to justify if we should and how we are handling the animals. So, physical capture. Many people that are not familiar with capture drugs may justify that physical capture is better. We handle the animals for a short time period and release them quickly. But even if you handle them just for a few minutes, the physiological changes may be even worse compared to if you have a longer anesthesia where you monitor the animals and make sure that the animal is in good health through the handling. But we don't know this if we don't evaluate and monitor and follow up what we are doing. So in Domestic species, we can do a physical examination before we anesthetize them. We can give them a, a drip, preventive care before. With the wild animals, you have a very short time before you dart them, before, and a short time period where you really need to optimize the handling of the animal before you release it back out into the wild and have no more influence on it. The domestic species, we have all these monitoring equipment, we have a controlled environment, lots of staff, in the wild, we often work in the dirt, in the snow, maybe with a dog as the assistant, or in the dark. So it's very different settings, but there's no reason to not optimize when we're working in the field. And lately, there's a lot of portable equipment that we can bring out into the field, but we still need to validate and evaluate it in different species and different settings. So here, for example, a portable ventilator, pulse oximetry, blood pressure monitoring, in-field blood analysis, and oxygen therapy. So a lot of my research have been on development of safe and effective immobilization methods and capture. And um, looking at the physiological effects, how can we uh, prevent and treat complications, and which methods are the safest or the best, and how, what are the drug doses to be used. Here's elephant handling in Sri Lanka. If we go continue with darting of animals, the dart, um, you want to hit a big muscle. Sometimes that's not what you hit. This, both of these animals were okay. The darting in the ear, we thought wouldn't give the animal enough dose to go down. It went down really fast. 
The other bear, you can see it looks like it might have been hit in the spinal cord, but it was no problem. It wasn't. It was no problem. Um, when you are doing helicopter darting or any darting that you are stressing the animal, there will be an adrenaline rush. The animal will increase its respiratory rate and heart rate. You're going to get an increase in body temperature. The lactic level, lactic acid goes up and the pH goes down. And at a certain level, this acidosis, the low pH, can actually cause a heart arrest. And it may, or it may cause problems later. There's a whole, uh, we can talk another hour about capture myopathy, the risks with the hyperthermia, high body temperatures and uh, high lactates. Um, and also when you are anesthetizing an animal, or for, for whatever reason you are capturing an animal, how long do you need to handle it? Is it to just remove a snare that is easily around the neck? Or do you have to, to do more wound cleaning or actually full-on surgery? So these are various uh, snare injuries on rhinos in southern Africa. And also the sampling. When we, sample, when we have access to wild animals, we should optimize the amount of s samples we collect. Back in the 70s, a lot of VHF collars were put on wild animals without even collecting a blood samples. Today, we can establish all these banking of materials um, and do a lot of measurements, body measurements, body weights. But is there a limit also? Can we collect too many samples? Where's the, 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 the amount of invasive work we do on the species? It's, just, it's an open question that we need to, to discuss also. And, it's important, I always work in, uh, in interdisciplinary teams, so I contact other professions before handling an animal, like what kind of sample would you like, especially if it's non-invasive samples, to collect as much as possible from each animal that is being handled. If we look at ear tagging, it's so many animals all over the world are being ear tagged, and a lot of these animals are only handled once. You put the ear tag on and you see it. You can follow that animal for the rest of its life. Yeah, it looks good if you look at these pictures. But if we look closer, like these uh, uh, bighorn sheep are only captured once. In the Scandinavian brown bear project, the brown bears are immobilized several times sometimes. And then we started looking deeper into how the ear tags affect the animals. And here you can see a small um, effect of the ear tag. But if you look further, there can be inflammation and infections. So after um, documenting this, the bear project actually stopped ear tagging the animals and used other methodologies. And this is just such a simple way to follow up and look on, on how the, the tagging is affecting the animals. When we deal with the animals, the, the handling, sometimes people say, oh, it died using this drug combination, but they handled the animal in the wrong position. So it wasn't the drug, it was the person who handled the animal that influenced the physiology of the animal. For example, these this bear, if you have, you have the blood pressure fall when you carry them like this, you should carry animals horizontally. There's a lot of discussions ongoing on the optimal um, positioning of big animals like rhinos. If you put them in lateral recumbency on the side, that will influence the, the lung function. Um, and if you don't monitor, you don't know. If we look at wolf immobilization, which is a hot topic and uh, a need for Im in improvements, uh, meditomidine ketamine solatil is one combination that can be used. And you see the heart rate, for example, is twice as high if you use only solatil. And uh, when we, these, we were doing comparative studies in Scandinavia, in Sweden, as well as in Alaska. And we could see that using the meditomidine solatil combination uh, you had less severe increase in heart rate, it was reversible so you could wake up the animals faster and less risk for hypothermia when you're working in the Clyde co Clyde cold climates. Um, there's a lot of changes, physiological changes, that you can't see if you just look at the animal. Hypoxemia is a low oxygen level in the blood and a lot of the drugs we are using for wildlife capture influence the, the blood levels. Um, and it can lead to morbidity, physiological changes, or mor mortality, where the animals actually die. So in the brown bears, you can see above 80 millimeter mercury, this is the oxygen level in the blood, is normal. These are the mean values and the extremes, the minimum and maximums. And there were bears in each time of immobilization that had 
low levels of oxygen. But we couldn't see this by just looking at the gums or monitoring heart rate. We had to do blood analysis and further studies. So, and based on this, we started looking at how can we prevent the hypoxemia, the low levels, by giving oxygen. How much oxygen should be given? How can we give the oxygen? So, and it's easy. Anyone can provide it by a simple uh, cylinder with a, um, a tube into the nose of the animal. Um, and there's also, we've done a number of studies on using portable oxygen concentrators. And these were developed for people, but they can also be used in wildlife. But again, we need to see how do they function in the cold, in the heat. And hyperthermia is a very common um, um, problem when you handle wildlife, whether they are immobilized or not. Physical restraint increases the stress level and increases the body temperature. So how can we treat it? You have to monitor it to notice if it goes too high and prevent it going too high, and then providing, for example here, fanning, cooling, you can give oxygen that cools and IV fluids. But I find this is really interesting. It's a South African colleague who's been looking at uh, impalas. And if you have impalas in an enclosure and you capture one, the other animals that are looking at the animal that is being captured, they, with the use of um, implants for temperature, they can see that there's a stress-induced hyperthermia in the animals that are seeing other animals being exposed to human uh, handling. So acute versus chronic stress, the main message here is that we, the best is to prevent it. And if you can't prevent it, we need to manage it through proper handling and tranquilization as well as options. I'll talk a little bit about that more later. But whenever animals are handled, it's important to be able to provide supportive care and emergency treatment. And I'd say that no animal should be immobilized unless you have a, a person in the capture team that is available to provide intravenous access, so you can give emergency drugs or provide a drip, and provide en um, endotracheal intubation and provide ventilation if the animal will stop breathing. And planning, if we go back, if, if you are capturing an animal, this is my field notes from uh, rhino captures in Asia. And, Everything from equipment to protocols, drugs, stress. How do we handle the transport crate, the helicopter? Are we doing a simulation before we go out into the wild? So there's a lot, a lot of planning. And you have plan A, B, and C. And, when, and you have to plan for the unplanned. So doing uh, bighorn sheep captures in the Rocky Mountains, darting it way away, but it runs into the gully. And actually the animal was ended up down here and we couldn't access it. And I had to dart it with uh, recovery drugs. And it, we never got to sample it, but the animal survived. And later this uh, rock climber could climb down and pick up the darts that were remaining, the missed darts, because it wasn't easy to dart uh, straight down. Um, also, handling and transport. There's a lot of people involved in many times in wildlife capture. And the noise level can be loud. And um, it's important to... to not stress the animals, especially if no drugs are being used, but I'm a strong advocate for preventing stress and anxiety by using um, long-acting tranquilizers or short-acting tranquilizers. And there's an, the drugs that take away the anxiety from the animal, so a wild animal may look like it's tame, just being less affected by all the activities going on around them. And also something that i am looked more into in the last few years is anti-ulcer medication. Because if you look, it's very hard to diagnose ulcer in a wild animal when it's alive. But based on patholo pathology, you can see that several animals have developed ulcers. So how can we prevent this? By both decreasing the stress as well as providing anti-ulcer medication if we are handling animals in rehabilitation, in translocation, in zoos, everywhere. It's very applicable. This is uh, from a study where bighorn sheep in the desert in Nevada are being... Ah, I had a picture before, and Yuan also showed it, of net gun capture, where you're shooting out a net from the helicopter, and you capture the animal. Two guys jump out, tie their legs together, and you fly them hanging under the helicopter, completely awake, with a blindfold and uh, uh, tied uh, ropes. 
and the uh, heart rate and body temperature when these animals are coming for handling, five to ten minutes handling, and all these samples are being collected and then they are loaded into a transport. And this was, is commonly done in North America without using any tranquilization, but in the last few years when we looked more into this, it's also uh, better uh, welfare for the animals if you do provide a tranquilization. Another important animal welfare perspective is the education, capacity building of people dealing with animals. Uh, we've had training workshops included in research projects and um, not only veterinarians but also the other um, assistants and keepers that are handling the animals uh, in a number of countries. And here we are doing simulations with the domestic species using a dog leg from a made up dog leg training on each other, and in-field training where we are dis having fruitful discussions and methodologies in the field. Up in Canada, these, these biologists had done uh, capture courses, but you need, further, if you, you need further training in the field with knowledge people. There's, um, it's been proven that you have, I mean, the experience, of course, is decreasing the risks for the animals. The World Wildlife Fund have been supporting training capture workshops for elephant capture in Myanmar, uh, where both mahouts and ele uh, elephant veterinarians were working together. So my conclusion, if we look at wildlife capture, is that there are no safe, completely safe methods. So there will be physiological changes, but we can improve the safety and the welfare for the animals if we prevent and decrease stress, if we monitor the physiology, if we prevent and treat complications and evaluate and improve the methods. So, and I'd also like, I love this quote, great minds don't think alike. We need to have multidisciplinary teams and work together and understand each other's roles and share the responsibilities and communication. Often when there's a problem, it's people not communicating well with each other. And there is expertise available, so use the expertise. We can't afford animal welfare if everyone who's handling a wild animal is experimenting on their own. If I'm working on a new species, I contact people who has worked on that species, I look up at the literature. And share your mistakes, because we can't afford to do them all ourselves, but, and there's a lot to learn from each other's mistakes. So we need to evaluate and keep improving and keep learning. And there's so much research needed to be done within this field. Thank you. Thank you, Osa. Very interesting presentation. We have time for one, maybe two questions. Anyone? Well, I have one. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, Johan. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, my question is, Osa, um, when you look at all this uh, preventive work, but also the complications, what is your view about having a, someone with a, a veterinarian on site or overseeing these kind of uh, procedures that where you, ha you would need that if you did it on a domestic animal, for instance? What's, what's your view on that? Well, veterinarians are trained in depth in everything from pharmacology to physiology. And I, I think, so veterinarians, there's a lot of people that are non-veterinarians that have been trained and doing wildlife capture. But like we, I mentioned before, I think if we are handling wildlife uh, under immobilization, you need to be able to provide emergency care and, uh, be able, and, and have access to all the drugs needed for specific treatments if the animals are injured. Or so, and also we need to monitor because if we don't monitor, we don't know what's happening to the animals. Uh, so it's, I think it's very good with the training courses that we have for various professions because we need, as working as a team, if the the assistants have high knowledge, that's also important to be able to support the the veterinarians in their work or the wildlife capture P team. Do you have a question? Just a question. Mm -hmm. Down there. 
thank you Osa for a very nice lecture. Um, I think that the point is that if you don't understand the pharmacology behind the medicines you are using, you can't prevent or even measure the right thing when you are doing the anesthesia, because as you said, there is a large scale between the bad anesthesia and a good anesthesia, and uh, death and good anesthesia, there is a big scale. You, there's a lot of problems you don't see if you don't measure them. Just animal surviving anesthesia, it, it's not a good, it's not a good, only good criteria. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Thank you, Osa. Uh, I just wonder, how do, you, how do you do when you have new species? What is your approach to that when you're going to uh, do some anesthesia and so on? And um, yeah, how, how much can you like, take knowledge from one species and, and use it for another species and so on? How do you, how do you work with that? Must Thanks for that question. Oh, the question is, that when you work on a new species, how do you get knowledge to, to do that? And uh, I will... Like with some captured drugs, you can extrapolate, you know, that some uh, drug combinations work well in carnivores and primates, etc. But if I'm working on a new species in a new setting, I will look what has been done with that species before. If nothing has been done, I will look at a similar species. I will call and talk to my zoo colleagues. I will email and mess my wildlife college and colleague, colleagues in different parts of the world and we will have discussions and so it's a lot of a, a lot of um, planning and then also yeah so a lot of background work and so and that's the thing share your mistakes and talk to people about what you're going to do so and it's a very interesting field because there's so much we don't know and by by looking deeper into it and uh, and also, I think there's a close relation between wildlife and zoo, because we can learn both ways. Sometimes what we learn in the wild is applicable for the zoo, and what we do in zoo settings can be brought into the field. And also for you, from the human side into the wildlife side. Okay, thank you very much. Um...